It's, my name is Scott Wyatt, and it's my privilege to be Arlene's bishop and to join with you today as we remember and celebrate the life of Mike Peterson. We just had a family prayer by Karen Lefevre, and the pallbearers today are Nicholas Lefevre, Alex Peterson, Russell Hall, Shane Larson, Ethan Zollinger, and Damon Peterson. Um, we'll start our service today um, with an opening song, If You Could Hide a Kolob, and we'll sing the first, second, third, skip the fourth, and then sing the fifth verse. We appreciate Liz Sampson and Alice Carlisle helping us with the music today. Following that song, our opening song, we'll have an opening prayer by Brenda Larson.
Our Father in heaven, we come before thee today with humble hearts and much gratitude for my, my father, Michael. Heavenly Father, thank you for releasing him from his body. We are so grateful that he was able to move on. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for his example in our lives, for his true testimony of Jesus Christ and passing that on to his family and loved ones. We are so grateful for our dear mother and for all that she has done. We are grateful for the opportunities we got to have over the last five years to serve mom and dad. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the gospel plan. We are grateful for the atonement. We ask a special blessing upon all those that are here to first know we love them and are grateful for them. But also, as they have traveled, please protect them. Please bless them. Please bless mom as she goes through this. Again, we are so grateful for this plan of salvation and the opportunity to see and join our loved ones again. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll now have a life sketch by Doug Peterson, and then a musical number by Brent Arnell, a poor wayfaring man of grief, accompanied by Arnett Zucker, and then Eric Peterson will speak. We'll go to that point on the program. Doug. First of all, I wanted to uh, extend a, a heartfelt gratitude and thanks for all of you guys for coming out here today and supporting our family throughout all of this, and especially supporting my mom. I appreciate that. <clears throat> my father, Michael R. Peterson, was born on September 8, 1941, to Russell and Barbara Peterson. He was the oldest of five children raised on the family dairy farm in Lewiston. He enjoyed life with his three sisters, Kathy, Jill, and Janet. Uh, his brother, Mark, passed away as an infant, which I'll touch on more in a moment. I remember my dad talking about how much he teased his sisters and acknowledged that it was probably too much. I only tease those I love is a phrase that he used. When dad was 11 years old, his baby brother, Mark, was born, but tragically passed away less than two weeks later. This was a very traumatic experience for dad and presented some life-shaping challenges in his life. Uh, he faced these challenges well and grew in strength and character. It was working on the farm where dad developed his strong work ethic. Uh, milking cows uh, twice a day was not for the faint of heart. He was an immense help for his father who taught him life skills and mindsets that set up my dad for future success. But Grandpa Peterson couldn't teach him to love farming. Whenever he could, he would find time where he would sneak away to fiddle with his chemistry set, make a slingshot or a boomerang, or practice judo on his sisters. Yeah. Scouting also played an important role in his development, and he excelled on his way to earning the Eagle, rank, Eagle Scout rank. My dad graduated from North Cash High School, and while in high school, he enjoyed math, chemistry, photography, art, and science fairs. He also had a love of learning, which is a good thing, uh, as you'll find out shortly. After one year of college, he accepted a call to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was assigned to the North German mission for, and served faithfully for two and a half years. He enjoyed serving abroad and had many experiences that strengthened his faith 
in our Savior, in our Savior Jesus Christ and develop a love of service and ministry. When he returned to Cache Valley, he returned to college at Utah State University and earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry. While an undergraduate at USU, dad met my mom, Arlene Dallimore. They were dating and, they, and then planned on being married in the summer after one year of graduate school. Uh, my mom was studying in Oregon and my dad was in California. During their Christmas break, they met in Lewiston and my dad's bishop said he felt impressed they should get married right away instead of waiting. So one week later, they were married on December 28th, 1966. Uh, they began the new year in Del Mar, California, where my dad continued his education. There, my dad earned a PhD in chemical oceanography at Scripps Institute of Oceanography of the University of California, San Diego. Uh, while living in Solana Beach, Dad had a graduate research assistantship while my mom worked at the, the UCSD library. They lived in a small two-bedroom apartment shared with a cabinet maker. And there, the Peterson family began to grow with my sister Karen and brother Eric being born there. From California, life took my mom and dad and their little family of four to Richland, Washington, where my dad worked as an analytic organic chemist at Battelle Northwest. In Richland, the rest of the Peterson clan was born. So my sisters, Amy, Brenda, Wendy, and lastly me um, as the caboose is what my dad would say. I enjoy hearing stories from my family about the glory days in Richland and their upbringing there. Long lasting friendships were created in Richland and forever there will be a soft spot in my family's heart uh, in the Tri-City area. When I was about two years old, uh, my family moved back to northern Utah. Uh, we settled in Providence, and my dad worked as an irrigation consultant for my Uncle Ron's agricultural and irrigation firm. While working and supporting his family of eight, he also returned to USU and earned his master's degree in irrigation science. Like I said earlier, my dad had a love of learning. I'm so proud of my dad for doing what it took to take care of my family, our family, we weren't rich and times were stressful, but it all worked out in the end. Because of my dad, I know all of my siblings try our best to step up and do what we need to to be a support for those around us. Uh, while growing up, it was clear that our father had a, a love for music, particularly classical, opera, and jazz. We spent hours dancing to music in the basement of our house. He loved to play loudly, and on occasion, his thunderstorm and rain soundtrack on a Saturday morning and he'd rush into the kids' room and exclaim that there was a big storm outside. Let's go watch it. <laughs> we loved listening to Let's Pretend Records, and if he got up early enough and climbed into his bed, he could recite the stories by heart. Dad was a great storyteller. Dad's hobbies included family history work, uh, in particular the Danish ancestry, astronomy, financial planning, computer, computer programming, and reading which on occasion would catch him reading school math books for fun. <laughs> so this was a source of a long running inside joke in our family. Again, the love of learning. Dad also liked to study languages. Uh, he took several years of college Russian classes, becoming somewhat fluent in the Russian language. He also taught himself Danish and Hebrew and never lost his ability to speak and read the German he learned on his mission. The best hobby that dad is known for mm, probably more of a passion, was gardening. Um, at our house we grew up in, uh, Dad added flower beds, trees, and decorative fencing to beautify our yard. Uh, in the backyard we had a vegetable garden and a small orchard with trees, fruit trees. We had cherry trees, apple, uh, apricot, pear, plum, and despite freezing temperatures and the occasional blight, my favorite was a peach tree. My dad put together an elaborate drip line irrigation system, of course, and helped turn out some of the most bounteous crops in the neighborhood. Dad loved his garden, and a fun memory is the day that dad bore his testimony in church, and he started out that he lost a dear friend. His apricot tree had died. <laughs> dad had all of us work in the garden regularly. Uh, he didn't have cows for us kids to milk early in the morning, but he had strawberries, golden raspberries, 
peas, beans, and other crops for us to pick. Near the end of each summer, my dad would say the words, and they were dreaded to some, it's time to do corn. <laughs> so picking and freezing the corn harvest was quite the uh, operation. Dad organized the shuckers, the washers, the boilers, the baggers, but only the skilled could be used as the cutters. After what seemed like an eternity later, we'd have all the corn cut and bagged and in the freezer. My dad used, gar uh, used gardening and the fruit of his labors for ministering opportunities. I remember us running grocery bags of food uh, to share with the neighbors. He made sure he took especially good care of those he home taught and ministered to. Um, on top of taking care of our own garden and yard, dad also took time to help neighbors with theirs. Um, I remember countless trips with my dad, loading up the tools in our old 1963 Ford pickup truck and going to neighbors to spray, prune, fertilize, and overall improve their yards. Wendy, Wendy who also loves to garden, uh, did yard work for neighbors as well, and several times created small, small disasters that she needed her dad to come over and save her. I absolutely, I absolutely loved working alongside my dad. I know I probably didn't always enthusiastically go out and work with him, but it was activities like those that myself and my brother and my sisters uh, forged our deep, our deep relationship with him. It was in the doing that we got to know our dad. Now we need to address our parents' frugality. frugality. Dad is a master of reduce, reuse, and recycle. We were recycling before it was even a thing. Paper, cardboard, and aluminum would take down to get it sold to help go towards uh, small expenses like church camping trips. We composted our garden each year. His old truck, which used to belong to my grandpa, had holes in the floor which were covered by plywood until the state inspector said no more because he was intoxicating himself with the fumes. <laughs> Dad wore clothing until it was so thin that you could see his garments better than his shirt. He patched up work boots with duct tape and so that he could get a few extra years of use out of them. Uh, Dad was the ultimate handyman, and I thought that he invented DIY, the do-it-yourself, right? As things broke around the house, no one was too concerned as Dad could fix it. Whether it was fixtures, appliances, um, or automobiles, Dad could figure out how to do it. Some of the greatest characteristics and attributes of my dad include his strong testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew he was a son of a loving Heavenly Father who instilled that love in our family. Dad was a faithful high priest in the Melchizedek priesthood and dedicated much of his life to serving others and to loving his neighbor. No matter their faith, creed, or color. In short, he tried to be like the Savior. He had a variety of church callings, and one of his favorite uh, was being a nursery leader uh, when he was about the age of 60. He walked to church any chance he got, and he rarely, rarely took the roads. Some of my siblings enjoyed this Sunday ritual of walking through the dusty fields on the way to the church building. In addition to serving a mission as a young man, uh, my dad and mom also served two missions in their retirement. Their first mission was to Durban, South Africa, and what an amazing experience it was for them. I remember the love and concern my parents voiced for the people in South Africa with all the economic and educational struggles that they faced there. They hoped that their service benefited, encouraged, and uplifted these amazing people because it sure did for them. A few years later, they were called to serve a local welfare mission in Logan, working with, their tr working with transit people who needed immediate help. It was very interesting, and once again, they saw their fellow brothers and sisters with Christ-like love. As I, was, uh, as I was reading one of my dad's brief personal histories, he listed off some of the things that he enjoyed, and some of those were what I mentioned before. Um, the last sentence meant the world to me. He said, I love to be with my family most of all. Mm. Whether it was individually reaching out to us kids, being a strength and lifting us up in private, 
or whether it was out openly, like building a new larger house when most seniors downsize. My dad and mom built their current lovely home so that we could all gather as one family under the same roof. All six children, their spouses, their 25 grandchildren, their one great-grandchild with two more on the way. Dad, we love being with you as well. We will miss you, but we look forward to a joyful reunion on the other side of the veil.
so you'll notice in your program at the very top of the page, there's the word funeral. Uh, the first three w letters of funeral spell fun, right? Right, so I, I don't know if I'm gonna bring a lot of fun, but I just want you to know that this is a joyous, <laughs> excuse me, wow, that started quick. It's a joyous occasion. I'm really looking forward to sharing my thoughts. There's gonna be a tiny bit of overlap with what Doug said, uh, but um, I thought I'd start off, I mean, we've still got about a half an hour, so. <clears throat> I, well, I, I brought a few math books with me. We could maybe break a few out. I've got a few chapters noted, um, and, and we could read a little of that. It's pretty exciting stuff. I, I even brought a, a chemistry book with me as well. And, and these, are, these are fun things <clears throat> for me to remember. Uh, my dad, because he he loved to learn. So um, hold on just a second. I'm going to arrange my papers here. Um, so I've been tasked with this idea of um, sharing more gospel principle things, and I'm going to try to be an obedient son. But I have some stories to tell, and uh, I hope to weave that together. And so I'll, I'll start off with the idea, this concept of the, the plan of salvation was presented and preparations made and set in motion when we read in the scriptures, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, uh, this, this portion of the service is gonna be a little bit of interaction with you and me. Um, I'm gonna take three longer breaths right now. And to make it less uncomfortable for you, uh, you can join me, all right? I think it'll make me feel better, and maybe you too. So we're just going to take three long breaths, okay? In through the nose, out through the mouth. Here we go. I, I do feel better. That's good. That's good. I'll, I'll try to hold this together the best I can. So let's go back to the scriptures. The Lord breathed, breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And that's how it began for all of us. Even the Son of God went through this experience and was born in an animal stable. Now, when we read in the scriptures that the young Jesus Christ increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about... Um, how my father's life followed the similar pattern. So about two years ago, when his health was failing, I took the time to sit down with my dad and talk to him. <clears throat> we talked about his struggles and his perspective and on the circumstances he was enduring and the circumstances that we all endure. Throughout his life, he's been very much a part of, of uh, or had a pattern of learning things and gaining knowledge. And he did this in abundance. It was almost an obsession. But I know why. He was motivated by dairy cows. He didn't want to do anything with them anymore. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how he, he lived his life. He's like, I don't, want, I don't want to be a farmer. You couldn't really take the, as you know and, and have heard, you can't really take the farm out of the farm boy. But um, I, I asked him uh, why he placed such a, a high value on education. And he said, and this is a, a quote, education creates op options. It allows one to be flexible and opens up other possibilities. That attitude, I, I think, was certainly influenced by his parents. So let me tell you about the moment near the beginning of his, uh, what I'll call self-directed learning. It was about the sixth grade. He was visiting his aunt, um, Thelma and Uncle Chet Simmons. And he was probably off in the living room or in another room, maybe the study, if you will. While the adults were talking, you know how it gets. The old people are jatting away and the kids get bored. And he, he wanders off and he finds an encyclopedia. And the encyclopedia has in it all kinds of information and he starts reading about chemistry. And it totally fascinated him as a sixth grader. He's like, what is this? I didn't even know this existed. And so he started reading about it more and more. And he ordered, uh, so back in the day, Amazon was the US Postal Service, right? 
And so he ordered a, um, a chemistry puzzle set. And it's kind of an odd thing, but this puzzle set was uh, created in a way that the certain pieces represented elements, and there's a very specific and orderly way that chemistry is arranged. And these puzzle sets mimic that. And so he could put these pieces together and create chemical compounds. And it was just a puzzle, but it was a way for him to learn chemical concepts and there were exercises and such to go with it. And he told me, he said, he said, you know, um, I, why am I crying about this? This is silly. He says, he says, you know, I remember sitting in my college classes and remembering how these, these puzzle pieces came together. He says, I use that, that small toy for his entire life. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, and, or as mentioned in junior high, he started uh, using a chemistry set. He, he ordered that, that was again on the, in the mail, he ordered a chemistry set. He need track down a couple of textbooks. I, I don't know if it was this one, probably not. This is a fairly a contemporary modern one. But he, he got a hold of a couple of textbooks. His parents uh, helped him do that, I believe through the library or whatnot. And he worked, he, he just devoured this information. He worked through every problem, all the chapter reviews and all the experiments. He did them on his own. This is the weirdest part. So coincidentally, when he gets to high school, so he's in junior high when this happens. So when he gets to high school, he notices that the same textbook's being used in his chemistry class in high school. Imagine the stunned look on the teacher's face in the second day of class. He shows up with his notebook full of all the answers and all the experiments and all the chapter reviews done. <laughs> and the teacher was so stunned by this, he said, well, let's give you some extra privileges. And the extra privilege was is he was allowed to uh, use the chem lab uh, while the teacher had a preparation hour. So he and his good friend Clarence Funk, they, uh, they spent time uh, making experiments. And they were allowed to do or perform any safe experiment that they could come across. And I'm not sure he really followed the rules when a glass hydrogen generator exploded in the lab and soaked a, 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 a lab table with sulfuric acid. Um, the, the teacher was patient. He understood that it was part of the process and not necessarily malicious, but my dad really enjoyed chemistry. So, another quote from Michael. Um, my dad counseled, learn to do things on your own. I'm just hearing him say this to me. Have a meaningful struggle, figure it out. And sometimes you'll need to practice to do things well. Well, as you learn more about chemistry, he came across these plans uh, to build a mass spectrometer. Who knows what a mass spectrometer is? Um, well, let me try to tell you, explain it to you. It's a, it's, it's, he took quite the initiative to construct a fairly technical scientific instrument in a barn in, in Lewiston, Utah. It's about the size of a, it's not shaped like a cello case, but it's about the size of a cello case. And he made it out of wood and metal and had all these different components to it. And I'll try to describe it to you the best I can. I'm, I'm no expert on mass spectrometers, but it, what would you use it for? Well, what it's for is to analyze the chemical compositions of samples. And I'll explain a little further. Uh, you, you, uh, this is how you do it. You grab your, your sample and you grind it up into powder. You pulverize it so that it sits inside and so it'll fit inside this small furnace. And what happens is you burn the, the stuff, the sample. And the sample emits, uh, the embers of that uh, sample emit certain wavelengths of light. And those wavelengths of light can be corresponded to known compounds and, and elements. It was just a way to analyze samples. Well, these, uh, the, the fire source cannot be a flame of fuel. So what would that be? Well, it happens to be an electric plasma. So, and it comes from an arc generator. He built an arc generator. 
<laughs> for his uh, mass spectrometer. So with shielding goggles and flashing lights, imagine this is late at night because he was working after school. He's in a barn and he's, he's watching these chemicals or, or these, these rock samples is what he was looking at. And he was looking for specific salts and understanding the relationship of geology across the state of Utah. But imagine, he's watching these flashing lights, he's got goggles on, he's in a barn, and it's, for the younger crowd, it's kind of like a Tony Stark's moment, right? I mean, this guy was a total egghead. <laughs> and, and, and I love him for it, because he just had this initiative to, to try. Well, um, I'll leave the chemistry now. So, as mentioned, he learned a number of different languages, and one of the languages he, he, gone, he, he caught on to was uh, the language of the Holy Land in Hebrew. He told me a little more detail about that. It was actually an Israeli couple that he met while he was uh, studying seminary at, at North Cache High School. And they uh, took it upon themselves to offer a Hebrew class, and, and he learned that he enjoyed languages along with chemistry. Some more counsel from Mike. Always be curious, develop a broad knowledge, and you will never be bored. So, these are a few stories about my father learning wisdom in this life and trying to be like the Savior. So, Dad gained, gained favor with God throughout his life by making and keeping sacred covenants. He also found connection to the Spirit by serving others. He enjoyed ministering to the Ward family and helping neighbors. He followed King, Benj uh, followed King Benjamin's counsel of when one is in the service of others, they are also in the service of God. I am certain he often, that he often felt the love of our Father in heaven as he lifted the burdens of those around him. Throughout his life, he served various church callings. And I'll, I'll add a little bit more detail to what Doug said. Some of his college required more time, some less. And his favorite was working with <clears throat> the nursery age children. As you can imagine, those children really touched his heart. He loved their purity and curiosity. I'm sure he sang with them the primary song, I'm trying to be like Jesus. As mentioned, he served three three missions. The last one, <clears throat> a service mission was perhaps the most difficult. As he and my mom were called to serve as welfare missionaries here locally, he told me on more than one occasion that he felt so inadequate. <laughs> inadequate for the assignment and not sure how best to serve. He really struggled to see children involved in difficult situations where they had no control. He tried to see those as the Savior would and did his best to allow others to feel how much God loves them. And that's probably the greatest service anyone could give to another. So in time, family history became quite an intense hobby. I think is, is, it's, nat it's natural to be pulled to learning about your ancestry and the sunset of life. And he was very focused on getting ordinance work done for his family. He showed me how much he had accomplished, and it was enormous. It was painstaking research, especially in the Dutch language. He, or the Danish language, excuse me. He, he performed uh, lots of research and, and reconnecting and, and sorting. Um, these efforts were truly remarkable, even intimidating uh, to most. Now, we're gonna pause for just a moment. I'm gonna, we're gonna play a game together. It's not a raucous game, but it's an interesting game. And the game we're gonna play is first, last, best, worst. And I invite you all to join me. The first, last, best, worst game is this. Think of the first time you met Mike, or grandpa, or dad, or whatever, or your first memory of, of Michael. Think of the last time you met him, or were with him. Think of the best time, and think of the worst time. 
make some mental notes, if you will, and even write them down. I would encourage you to add, add them to family history or, or family search in his memories. I promise if you do this, you'll feel a greater connection to Michael and to those around you. So here we go. I'm going to show you how this is done. First, last, best, worst. This is the first, it took me a while to figure this out, and that's part of the exercise, part of the game. When I was a child, about three or four years old, we would play together in the backyard. We had one of those small rubber bouncy balls, and he would kick that ball straight up in the air so far that I thought, or so high, that I thought it would never come down. So I remember how much I admired how strong my dad was. That's my first memory. My last memory of my dad was a week ago Thursday. And I'd spoken with my mom Wednesday night. And uh, he was explaining, she was explaining how things were going. And I had an impression to arrange my schedule so that I could come up from Salt Lake City to see him. I spent my last moments I spent my last moments with him, holding his warm hand and expressing my love. He passed the next day, the next morning. I am so grateful to have had that moment with him. My best memory of my dad was a casual conversation, but for, for him, but for me, it was a seismic shift in our relationship. It happened in my late 20s. I don't really remember the specific details of the interaction, but it went something like this. Eric, I have a question for you. What do you think about this? The question was something technical regarding building design or a specific system specification. And he wanted to know my thoughts and opinion about it. It took me a minute to realize what had happened. As I reflected on this moment, it became, I became deeply humbled. As this was the first time I could remember that the smartest guy I've ever known sought out my experience and expertise. Now I have, sorry, I have two worst memories of my dad. And uh, so I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, but bear with me. The first one my siblings uh, can relate to, I'm sure. When I was studying linear algebra in college, <laughs> I would go to my dad for tutoring. He helped me understand a lot of tough concepts. And you know, it kind of bugged me that he could pick up a math book and any college class I was taking and know the concepts well enough to be a pretty decent teacher. That was kind of annoying because I couldn't understand. Well, one of those tutoring sessions was particularly hard and I got frustrated. And with the arrogance of a college age child, I pushed my dad's patience too far. He simply stopped the conversation and interaction and said, we're done. I'm not going to help you anymore. Not just today, but never again. <laughs> now, he, he'd made such statements before but didn't stick to him, but this time it was different. I was deeply stunned. I remember feeling so rejected. And I, and I went off and sobbed uh, because I was for sure disappointed that my dad would no longer help me with math. But I was more disappointed in myself <laughs> that I had soured our relationship to the point of being turned away. Now, don't worry. That experience happened before my best memory of my dad. Okay, <laughs> So all is well. But that was one of my worst memories. Now, here's my second worst memory I have of my dad. Now, about five years ago, my dad hurt his back in a fall working in his yard. This accident changed him. 
The pain became chronic and difficult to manage. This kind of pain has a way of occupying every moment and thought. The aftermath of this injury consumed him. There were many dark and lonely days of questions and wondering, why me? At one point, he looked at me with tears streaming down his face, wondering if he was going to make it. Wondering if his anguish was a judgment of sorts and he was failing. He lost hope. He didn't understand the need for his suffering. He had lots of despair. He felt as if he was being punished and left alone by his Father in heaven. Well, heaven eventually answered. It was in a general conference address. I remember it well. It was in October of 19, or 2021. I was listening to this talk and I was praying that my father was hearing the same thing. It was by Elder Anthony D. Perkins. I want to read some seg a segment of that talk. Regardless of where you live, physical or emotional suffering from its variety of trials and more mortal weakness has been, is now, or someday will be a part of your life. Physical suffering can result from natural aging, unexpected diseases, and random accidents, hunger or homelessness, or abuse, violent acts, and war. Emotional suffering can arise from anxiety or depression, the betrayal of a spouse, parent, or trusted leader, employment or financial reversals, unfair judgment by others, the choices of friends, children, or other family members, abuse in its many forms, unfulfilled dreams of marriage or children, the severe illness or early death of loved ones or, or many other sources. How can you possibly endure the unique and sometimes debilitating suffering that comes with each of us? Gratefully, hope is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ and hope can also be a part of your life. Today, I share four principles of hope drawn from scripture, prophetic teaching, and many ministering visits on my own ongoing and in my own ongoing health trial. These principles are not just broadly applicable, but also deeply personal. I'm going to read the four and I'll just refer you to the talk to get into detail of them. We don't have time to endure all of it. <laughs> First, suffering does not mean God is displeased with your life. Second, Heavenly Father is intimately aware of your suffering. Third, Jesus Christ offers his enabling power to help you have strength to endure your suffering well. And fourth, choose to find joy each day. I am so deeply grateful for Heavenly Father's tender mercy. Through his servant, Elder Perkins, this message was powerful. Dad's life was changed in a most remarkable way. He began bearing an empath, an empathetic witness of the, or emphatic witness of the plan of salvation and talking about heaven, the Savior, and God in hopeful and reverent tones. His faith was reignited. And that is how he left his life. Now, a little more participation. We're going to do some more breathing. I want you to hold your breath with me for 10 seconds. If you're brave, go 15. But join me in this. Ready? Just as you wanted your next breath. My dad yearns for you to know that the plan of happiness is the way to peace. Just as sure as we're all sitting here celebrating his life, the Lord is inviting us all to follow his example by making covenants, recognizing the spirit, following its guidance, and serving our neighbors. We will miss our dad, husband, father, and grandfather. And I, will, I am certain 
that we will meet him in a joyful moment, that will never That will never end. I bear you my witness of gospel truth. The Savior loves us all. He has a plan. We're all a part of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Just a couple... <clears throat> Announcements that uh, you're probably aware of, but I'll say them anyway. Following the service, those that desire to participate or attend the dedication of the grave will travel to the Hyde Park Cemetery to do that. And then immediately after that, families are going to come back and have lunch in the Providence Fifth Ward Church, uh, compliments of the Relief Society of the Fifth Ward. So join in those as, as you would like. Um, I'd like to express uh, our appreciation to everyone for participating today and in particular the appreciation for Mike in living such a great life that gives us the opportunity to get together and celebrate it, remember him, and uh, talk about the wonderful things that, that we've all learned from him. Before we have the closing song and prayer, I'd like to bear my testimony. that I know that we all lived before we came to this earth. Perhaps we knew each other and maybe we had the same chemistry class. I'm sure we had to learn something about chemistry before we came to this life. Um, and then we were all born and get to experience this earthly existence to gain a body, and to gain experiences through trials and tests and challenges and difficulties. And they come in a different form for each person. But this is the life to learn and to gain and to realize our need of a savior and a redeemer, a healer for each one of us. And after we die, we will all see each other again because life continues uninterrupted. And that will provide a glorious um, reunion for all of us and continuing to learn and to develop and to grow. And until that day, um, we look forward to seeing Mike again. I want to bear my testimony that the God lives, that Christ loves us, that he cares deeply for us, that he has atoned for our sins and our heartaches, our difficulties, our trials, and looks forward to greeting each one of us in the next life. This is the plan of salvation, the plan of happiness, um, and it is God's work and his glory. And Mike is a step ahead of all of us today, and we will join him in our own due time as God sees fit. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We'll now have our closing song, hymn number 220, Lord, I will follow thee, after which Amy Hall will give us the closing prayer.
Our dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we had this day to gather, to remember our father and husband, grandfather, and the life that he led. We are so thankful for his example, for his love of our Savior and of the plan of salvation. We are so thankful for the comfort that it brings to us and the knowledge that we have that we'll be able to see him again. We ask as we travel into the cemetery that we will do so safely, that we will be able to find comfort as we continue to grieve and to mourn. We are so thankful for the blessing of the gospel in our lives. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. 